in the morning of Sunday, the 9th of um, September, 1739, about uh, 20 enslaved Africans gathered near the Stono River in St. Paul's Parish, less than 20 miles from Charlestown, which is present-day Charleston in South Carolina. The enslaved people headed to a shop that sold firearms and ammunition, where they killed the shopkeepers and armed themselves. From there, they walked to the house of one Godfrey, burned the house and killed Godfrey, his son and daughter. They then continued marching, carrying banners that proclaimed liberty. They kept shouting the word liberty as they marched. The leaders of these brave Africans was a man who is said to have been captured from the area now known as the country of Angola. His name was Jemmy. As they marched, more and more people, both men and women, kept joining them as they made their way towards Charlestown. By the evening of that day, their number was around 100. So exactly what made this group of Africans decide that enough was enough? Welcome to the Sankofa Pan-African series. Please support us through Patreon or by buying me coffee so we can continue to bring you this uh, uh, series. Subscribe if you've not yet done so. Turn on your notification buttons and please continue to share our videos with your contacts. Well, there seems to have been more than one catalyst that ignited the Stono Rebellion, which was one of the most violent uprisings of enslaved Africans in the US. First, news had reached South Carolina that several small groups of runaways from South Carolina had successfully reached Florida, where they had been given land after they found freedom. At the time, England and Spain were at war. And Spain, which had control of Florida, and which wanted to spite the neighboring English uh, colonies, issued a proclamation stating that any slave who deserted and found their way to St. Augustine in Florida, would be given their freedom. The rebels believed that if Spain won, then the Spanish would be in a position to honor their promise that those of them who escaped and got to St. Augustine would be granted their freedom. Certainly, the promise of freedom must have influenced the potential rebels and made them unwilling to continue to accept their situation. The rebels also believed Spain's promise because an epidemic had disrupted the English colonial administration in Charlestown. So it seemed ready for plucking. Also, as the population of enslaved people in South Carolina had continued to grow, the white colonies became fearful that they might overthrow them. So they began to draw up a Negro Act that would limit the already limited uh, privileges of slaves. As such, in the middle of August, preceding the Stono Rebellion, a Charlestown newspaper announced that a security act would be enacted because the white people were scared of just such an insurrection. The Security Act mandated all white men to carry firearms to church on Sundays because before then, white people did not carry their guns to church. <laughs> anyway, anyone who did not comply with the new law by September the 29th of that year would then be subjected to a fine. So it, it is apparent that some of the rebels could read and write because they carried banners declaring their liberty. They were also not simply 
blood hungry people because they took the trouble to spare some white people who must have been benevolent to black people. For example, as they continued to head south, when they got to a tavern called Wallis Tavern, because the innkeeper was kind to his slaves, his life was spared. Some enslaved people actually went to the trouble of protecting their masters, even though they still joined the rebellion. By the end of the day, they had almost reached the Edisto River, but one lieutenant uh, uh, governor, Boo, had escaped to alert other white people. By the late afternoon of the second day, close to 100 armed white people had set out after them. But unlike the rebels, the white attackers did not discriminate. And by dusk, about 30 people were dead while some others escaped. Most were captured over the next month and summarily executed. Others were captured over the following six months. And, but one of the rebels even managed to elude capture for about three years. The Security Act, which had already been proposed, was very quickly finalized and approved after the Stono Rebellion. The Act laid out some very stringent restrictions, which had been effect, in effect, but had not been strictly enforced before the Negro Act was passed. Enslaved people were thereon prohibited from growing even their own from growing their own food or assembling in groups learning to read and write uh, by law they were prohibited from doing these things thanks for watching please please support us through patreon and by buy me coffee it's the only way we can continue to bring you this series subscribe if you've not yet done so Turn on your notification button so you know when we have new episodes. Don't forget to share our videos with all your contacts. And please keep those comments coming. They help us shape, you know, the episodes that we're doing. Thank you.